Let us pray. God, our Father, we do thank you for the gift and for the giver, and we ask your blessings upon both. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Now, would you turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel according to John chapter 20 as we consider this morning verses 29 through 31. Let us, let us pray. God, our Father, we ask now that you would bless your word as it goes forth. We pray, Father, that you would give us ears to hear, give us receptive hearts, teach us how to apply the principles of your word to our everyday living, and show us how your word applies to us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So we have, uh, since Resurrection Sunday, um, looked at some of the scenes, some of the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we looked first at his appearance to Mary Magdalene, and we talked about her devotion to Christ. And then we saw how Jesus appeared to the group of disciples, and Thomas wasn't there, and we talked about the importance of being in worship. And then we talked a little bit about Thomas's response to the risen Christ. And so this morning, we're going to conclude the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospel according to John in this particular section. And so we begin this morning with verse 29, John chapter 20, beginning with verse 29, which is the concluding verse in Jesus' encounter with Thomas. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Verse 30, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God. So this morning, we want to look at this concluding paragraph, this concluding remark that John makes in chapter 20. And as we do, we want to understand that there are various themes, major themes in the gospel according to John. And among the major themes that we find in the gospel according to John is the theme, is the word life. So life is a major theme in this gospel according to John. And in the gospel, the word life has a twofold meaning. So whenever we see the word life in the gospel according to John, it has a twofold meaning. First, it means life in the present. That means life in the right now. And secondly, it means life in the future. It is life beginning in the present that moves into and through the future. And so life is an important theme in the gospel according to John. The word life first appears in the prologue of the gospel in chapter 1, verse 4, where after introducing Jesus as the word that was with God and was God, John, the writer of this gospel, says about Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. This life that John refers to in the prologue of his gospel refers to the uncreated eternal life of God. It makes reference to the divine and unique uh, life that God himself possessed. Uh, this is the life that God breathed into Adam in the Garden of Eden at creation. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. This is the life that is offered to all fallen humanity through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the life of which John speaks in chapter 20, verse 31, saying that believing you may have life in this name. 
John says about life in the gospel, chapter 3, 15, Jesus says, whoever believes in me shall have everlasting life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my words and believes in me and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment because he has passed out of death into life. Life is a major theme in the gospel according to John. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes but to kill, steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And then in the seventh sign in the book of John, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Life, my brothers and sisters, is a major theme in the gospel according to John. In that book, there are 32 mentions of the word life. Life is a major theme in this writing, and he begins, John does, begins with a focus on life, and he concludes with a focus on life. In our text today, John 20, verses 30 through 31, John brings his narrative to a conclusion, and he gives the reason for his writing. Look at what it says, verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so the question I want to raise this morning is, what does it mean to have life in his name? What is, what is the significance of having life? life in his name. First, life in his name is a spiritual matter. Life begins on the inside. The Bible teaches that this is life that begins in the spirit. It begins in the heart. We call it regeneration. You must be born of the spirit. It is the spirit who gives life. And as Jesus explained to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of the gospel according to John, this new life is gifted to you upon your confession of faith. It was God's plan to give you life, and that's why Jesus announced, I have come that they might have life. And it was Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Bible says you were once dead to God because of our rebellion against God. That rebellion separated us from God. But when you acknowledge your rebellion and accepted God's offer for redemption, then you became spiritually alive. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, God made you alive. It was an act of God that started on the inside when you confessed Jesus as your Savior. You are now, because you are alive, you are now participating in the life of God. And the reason you can participate in the life of God, hallelujah, is because God has given you life. You are worshiping, and you pray, and you have devotion in your life. You know why? Because God has given you life. You know God, and God knows you. Do you want to know why? Because God has given you life. You experience God every day, don't you, in various ways, and you acknowledge when you experience his presence. And you know why you can do that? Because God has given you life. He speaks to you, and he guides you, and he knows you, and you know his voice. And the only reason you do is because God has given you life. Life. Life is a significant thing. You acknowledge that God lives and that God protects you and that God provides for you, don't you? Yeah, you do. The reason you are conscious of God's presence and cognizant of God's activities in your life is because God has made you alive. It's new life that God gives when you believe. 
Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. This is, not, this is not a superficial belief. I'm not talking about that. I'm not, I'm not talking about a superficial book belief in Jesus. I'm not just talking about an intellectual acceptance of Jesus. I'm, when I talk about belief, we're talking about believing him and trusting him for salvation. When we talk about belief, especially in light of chapter 20 of the gospel according to John, we're talking about believing that he died for your sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and God raised him from the dead on the third day. That's what he means by believing. And that's why John says that by believing, you have life in his name. It is life. In his name. It's, the first thing it is, is, is spiritual life. It's spiritual life. But secondly, it's a life begins on the inside, but it doesn't stay there. It's a life that's lived out. It begins on the inside, and it is lived out. It is, it is new spiritual life that activates your outward life of faith. That's why you ought to be able to tell the difference between a believer and an unbeliever by their lifestyles. Because when you believe this new life, it begins on the inside, but it doesn't stay there. It's lived out. It is spiritual life that activate, activates the outward life of faith and service, and they are manifested in at least four ways. This life is manifested in the power to pursue your purpose. Secondly, it is the power for a productive life. Thirdly, it is the power for living. And fourth, it's the power to ver persevere. Amen. Those four things. So when, when you get this spiritual life, it makes a difference in your everyday life. Amen. And, and first, it gives you the power to pursue your purpose. Our purpose is to glorify God wherever we are and whatever we do. Write that down. My purpose is to glorify God. God recreated me in order to glorify him. And that's why Jesus says that all men will see and glorify my father in heaven if you have love one for another. That's living it out. Your purpose is to glorify God. He has given you a station in life. He has given you a career or, or vocation or whatever God has assigned your hands to do, do it to the glory of God. To live out the life that God has given to you is, is glorifying God. God has made you kingdom people. You are a new creation. You are, your purpose is to be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. His, his purpose, your purpose, is to glorify God and to make God's presence known on the earth. That's what our purpose is. You create kingdom space because we hold in these earthen vessels we call bodies the incomparable treasure of life that God has given us. So when you show up, wherever you are, you bring God's presence. You bring love and truth and compassion and justice with you. Whether you are in a classroom or a courtroom or the bedroom, you bring God's presence with you. Whether you're standing online at the supermarket on Main Street or if you are an investor on Wall Street or if you are in the unemployment line, you bring the presence of God with you with you, whatever your occupation, whatever your status, you have been gifted with new life in Christ. You have purpose, and your purpose is to glorify God. So parent to the glory of God. Be married to the glory of God. Live single to the glory of God. Live your professional life to the glory of God. Live life as a military person or a politician or a professor or teacher. Whatever God has assigned your hands to do, you ought to do it. We ought to do it to the glory of God. Your purpose, first of all, is to bring glory to God. It's an outward expression 
of the life that God has given to you. And then not only is it helps us to pursue our purpose, but it gives power for productivity. It gives power pro, for productivity. You can call it prosperity. You can call it fruitfulness. You can call it productivity. I like the word fruitfulness because fruitfulness is the typical biblical description of a productive life. And there are several passages in Scripture where the Bible teaches that God expects his new creation to be productive, prosperous, and fruitful. Your fruitfulness reflects the kindness and the greatness and the generosity of our king. Did y'all get that? Your fruitfulness, your productivity, it reflects the greatness, the goodness, and the generosity of our king. Now, you know God has been good to you. Amen. Yes, he has. He's good all the time, and all the time he is good. And you know that God is great and greatly to be praised. You know that God is generous, that he has poured out on us far more than we need. And when God, our king, is good and great and generous, it ought to be reflected in our lifestyles. Every king wants his subjects to be prosperous and fruitful. God has created you to be the head and not the tail. He has created you to be the lender and not the borrower. Amen. Psalms 1 is still true. God wants you to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever you do, you prosper. The strategy for prosperity really is found in Psalm 1. Amen. And I'm not just talking about material prosperity. I'm talking about a prosperous character, a prosperous conduct in life. I'm talking about when you show up, God shows up. I'm talking about how you present yourself to, to the world. You are productive and you are fruitful. The king expects his investment to get a return. Amen. He expects you to invest the talents that he has given to you so that when he comes, he can get a return. And the Bible says that he rewards those who have been faithful, who have been fruitful. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful or productive or fruitful in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many. Jesus said, if you want to be fruitful, you got to stay connected to the vine, because without the vine, you can't bear fruit. And Jesus says in chapter 15, the first few verses of the gospel according to John, that when you're connected to the vine, he gives you the ability to bear fruit, and in bearing much fruit, you bring glory to the Father. God does not want you to be impoverished spiritually. He wants you to bear fruit. God wants us to bear fruit in our relationships, to bear fruit in our service. He wants us to be fruitful in our generosity, in our vocation. He wants us to be fruitful in our imagination. He wants us to be fruitful spiritually and socially and financially and intellectually and emotionally. Life in his name is lived out productively. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life more abundantly. And new life gives us power for productivity. So the new life, it helps us. It manifests itself in several ways. It gives us the power. It gives us, helps us power to pursue our purpose. It gives us power for productivity. And then it gives us power for living. That's the third thing. It gives us power for living. In Jesus Christ, your life status has changed. You have become a citizen of the kingdom of God and a child of the king. And as a child of the king, you have been given, your daddy has given you authority to use his name. So you can show up and you have the authority, you have been given the right to use his name. Now, not to misuse his name, 
but to use his name. And he's declared already that you are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. So now you are more than conquerors with the authority to use the name of Jesus. You make your request known to the Father in his name. Amen. There are several things that we do already in his name. We make our request known in his name. Amen. Yes, we do. We give our testimony in his name. We thank God for his blessings on our lives in his name. We pursue his will for our lives in his name. We conclude every prayer in his name. We start our day in his name. We claim the promises he has given to us in his name. You receive the promise in his name. You have the authority to use his name. And there is healing in the name. There is restoration in the name. There is help in time of need in the name. There is power in the the name of Jesus. No other name has been given among men through which we can be saved. And the name of Jesus and his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Yes, Lord. There is power in his name, y'all. There is power in his name. That's why you call him. And you don't even know why you call him. You just call him Jesus. My God. Because inside, deep inside, you know that there is power in his name. That when you call on that name, he shows up. And when he shows up, he makes a difference. Thank God that we have the authority not to misuse, but to use his name. And then there is power to persevere in this name. This is the, this is the life that John is talking about, just a snapshot, just a, just a few tiny characteristics of what the Spirit tells me that we have when we have life in his name. We have the power to pursue our God-given purpose, so no excuses for giving up. We have the power to pursue God's given purpose in our life. So if you're not doing anything, if you're not pursuing your purpose, you need to recheck and make sure that you are born again. Amen. And then we are, we have, we are given the power to have productivity. We are given the power to be fruitful, spiritually fruitful, fruitful with the work of our hands in the name of Jesus. Then we have the power for living because we have the authority to use our daddy's name to get into places that are close to us. We have the authority to use our daddy's name to get the resources that we need in order to pursue our purpose. We have the authority to use our daddy's name. But then we have the power to persevere. And there is power to persevere. Jesus says in the gospel, in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We are overcomers because we have been given life in his name. And that's why you're still standing this morning or sitting or whatever you're doing. That's why you showed up today, because there is power in his name, and he gives you power to persevere in the midst of uncertainty of all kinds of trials and trouble and tribulation. You are still pressing on. Somebody need to say amen right there. Even with all kinds of sickness and shortages and insanity that's going on in the nation today, you still you're still holding strong and you're pressing on. You're persevering. You're still standing amidst confusion and misinformation and outright deception and lies. You are still holding on. You are still standing because there is power in the name and there is power to persevere. Amen. There's, there's a book and it's, it's, a common, it's a common illustration of the book written by Pastor Freddie Hines. Her, Freddie Hines, who, uh, who talks about three kinds of Christians, says some Christians are like a brick, and when life throws them down, they just, they just splatter, crack up. And some, some Christians are like clay, and when you slow down, throw them down, life throws them down, it just splats. He said some Christians are like a rubber ball, and that's like you. And it's the heart, the, the rubber ball, you throw it down, it bounces back up. And, and not only that, it was added to the harder you throw it down, the higher it bounces back. And that's perseverance. 
that's what you have in life in Jesus. That's why you can come through the trouble. That's why you can make it up the rough side of the mountain. That's why you can traverse the valleys and come through storm and come through hell because God has given you life to persevere. You can press on in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, so it, life is given. It begins on the inside. Amen. And then it works its way out, and then it lasts into eternity. It's everlasting life, you see. It's everlasting life. And this is, this, is not, this is not, you know, you just wait now to go to heaven. No, 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 no. It begins here. You, you're a new creation now, and you have work to do now. But the life that God has given you is eternal life. It's everlasting life. If you know that you have life in the name of Jesus, then you know that it's everlasting life. And see, that's why John waited to talk about this life until after the resurrection of Jesus, until after Jesus encounters his disciples. And he tells them, you can feel this body. Come on, put your hands, put your hands in the prints of my hand and, and give me a piece of meat. You Give me a piece of bread and some fish. You know, ghosts don't eat. This is the real thing. This is the resurrected body. And, and so King Jesus has overcome the world. They nailed him on the cross and he died, but he got up again on the third day. And, and he's our king and our king he reigns he reigns right now and he's a king with integrity he's not a lying president or a lying prime minister or a lying general or a lying senator he's a king he's our king and our king has integrity and he says he will return for his bride which is the church he will return we don't know how we don't know when but we do know that God will keep his word. Jesus says, I will come again to receive you that where I am, there you may be also. And so you just hold on because the transformation is going to have to take place in order for you to experience life in your resurrected body. Amen. The, the, we're going to have to be, we, we are planted, amen, a natural body but we'll raise the spiritual body. Yeah, we are, we are planted, we are planted perishable, but we are raised imperishable. Amen. He, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No. Our mortality has to be clothed with immortality. Amen. There's a, there's a resurrection body that's being prepared for God's people. And, and my brothers and sisters, I, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to talk about uh, heaven. This, this is not a, you know, suffer now and going to heaven sermon. That's not what this is. And, and I don't want you to think like that. But I do want you to know that God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth. And you and I will have new bodies to work in this new heaven and this new earth. And my brothers and sisters, that life that we'll live through eternity has already begun right now. And so John says, these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may receive life and that more abundantly in his name. Now, John is writing to two people, to two audiences. He's writing to those who already believe, and he's saying to them, to us, hold on. He's saying, don't, don't get discouraged. He's saying, life might get tough. He's saying, you might have to endure sickness and trials and temptation and you might even have to endure a pandemic or a war, but hold on. You hold on. Be encouraged because your king has overcome the world. And even if sickness takes your physical body, God's going to raise it up. It's going to be different. So you just hold on. And he's writing to those who believe to encourage them to believe. But he's also writing to those who are not believers. And he's saying to you, if you're not believing, he's saying this life is available to you. God does not discriminate. This life is available for you. 
It's a gift. Satan comes to steal your faith, to kill your joy, and to destroy you. God has come in the person of Jesus that you might have life. If you're contemplating taking your own life, that is not of God. He has come that you might have life. He has life abundant, in abundance for you. You just have to receive it. Receive it by faith. Make a telephone call and get some help. Talk to somebody. Don't suffer by yourself. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross, not so that you could take your own life. He died on the cross. He gave his life so that you could live. Now live in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus those demonic thoughts of self-destruction. In the name of Jesus, those strongholds in your life. In the name of Jesus, those addictions that you feel you can't shake. In the name of Jesus, I declare, loose God's people and let them go. Amen. This one thing, and I'm finished. Mary and Martha of Bethany had a brother named Lazarus. And they all loved Jesus, everybody, the entire family. They loved Jesus tremendously. Jesus was away from Bethany when Lazarus got sick. And the sister sent a message, Jesus, come right away. Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. The Bible says that Jesus delayed his going to Bethany until Lazarus died. But when he showed up, he called Lazarus out of the grave. And when he called Lazarus out of the grave, he wasn't finished. Lazarus was bound with grave clothes. So he couldn't move like God wanted him to move. He couldn't operate like God wanted him to operate because he had to have the grave clothes removed. And then Jesus, after he called him from the dead, afterwards he said to the grave clothes, loose him and let him go. Now, why did you say that, Pastor? Because the day you were born again and you came out of your grave, but you got some grave clothes wow. that haven't been shed yet. So what I want you to do is just hop around in those grave clothes, and the same God who gave you life is the same God that will shred those grave clothes from your life. Trust me, because I've been there. It's no secret what God can do. What he's done for me, he can do for you. Amen.